Thanks so much, Sean. Um, yeah, so we are uh, in a series called Stepping Forward Together, the what, who, and how of Cedars Church. And in this series, we're really just trying to orientate ourselves about what we're all about. Um, and as you can see on the screen there, I've divided it into three sections. The first three messages are our foundations, all about what we believe. And then we're going to see uh, in the, the next few weeks our identity, who are we in, in light of what we believe. And then finally, we'll think about the practice in, in light of that identity that God has given us, that mission he's given us, who, uh, what do we do? Um, so the, the first one is what we believe. The second one is who we are. And the third bit is, is uh, what we do. Um, and thought it was really important to, to begin with our foundations because actually as a church we need solid rock, don't we? We need to be built on God's word. And so we had uh, a week where we looked at the whole story of the Bible from creation to new creation in one week. And then last week we covered all nine of, uh, of our uh, doctrinal statements in our, in our what we believe section. Um, today we're going to think about the, the very center of our faith, which is the gospel. We're going to think about the gospel. The gospel lies at the very heart of who we are as a church. A any true church will keep the gospel of Jesus at the center. Um, th there may be some differences in the way we worship and, and structure ourselves, but a true church has the gospel of Jesus at the very center. Um, the word gospel means good news. Good news. It's... it's um, an Anglo-Saxon word in, in terms of gospel, but, but it comes from a Greek word, euangelion, which means good news. And uh, it wasn't a religious word originally. It was used often, actually, in, in military victories. So if, um, as you perhaps may picture, in the ancient world, there were lots of battles, lots of wars, uh, and some would stay at home and would no doubt be fearing the worst, uh, but when a victory was won, someone, a herald, a messenger would come and announce gospel, good news, there is a victory, uh, and the people were, of course, thrilled to hear that. And so that language was drawn upon to show what God has done for us in Jesus, that he's done a victory, he's won something that should therefore bring us joy. And so a really appropriate word, uh, the word euangelion, gospel, Jesus brings good news. Jesus brings salvation. Um, so the Christian faith is all about good news. And actually, my hunch, or I think it's more than a hunch, I think we all know that most people who have no church background do not associate Christianity generally with good news, do they? Um, they may have all kinds of preconceptions, but good news is probably not the primary answer you're going to hear when you ask people, what do you think of when you hear the word Christianity? But good news is what it's all about. I suspect most people think that we believe that there is a God who sets a bunch of rules, and if we manage to do a reasonable job of keeping them, then we might just be okay with this God. That's the perception. But actually, the Bible has a very different perspective. It does, of course, affirm a, a God who sets rules, but actually it says that we are totally incapable of keeping them. Um, we saw that when we thought about the storyline of the Bible, that, that uh, since Adam, that actually each one of us has a fallen nature. And so we actually find ourselves very far naturally from this God, and what we need is a rescuer. We need reconciliation, and the glorious good news of Christianity isn't that we're scrambling to try and claw our way back to God. It's that he's acted on our behalf when we were powerless, when we were dead. He's worked to bring us to himself. That is why it's so good news, such good news, and it's absolutely vital for a church to be clear on this. That this is the most fundamental thing that a church needs to be clear on. The things I'm sharing this morning are central to the Christian faith. Um, and as I came to think about how do I, how do I teach on the gospel, that I just thought, wow, there's so many ways we could go about this, actually. Um, and the gospel is sort of almost like a sort of multifaceted diamond, that there's so many beautiful parts to it that actually there's loads of different avenues you could go down. Um, but I want to, to speak on, on what I think are the four most important parts of understanding the Christian gospel. There's loads of other benefits that flow from these things, but these are the things that lie at the very heart. And so I've chosen four headings, which is this, God, people, salvation, and response. God, people, salvation, 
response. So we're going to unpack those things this morning. First of all, God, as we think about the gospel, we first of all need to think about God because the good news of the gospel is that we can be restored to God. And so if we don't think about God first, we don't see why we would need this or who it is that we're being restored to. As we've seen in recent weeks, God is our creator God. Um, As Christians, we believe that this world is not all that there is. The world isn't just some accident. Rather, it is the creation of a creator. Uh, we, We read in one of the Psalms, Psalm 19, the heavens declare the glory of God, the skies proclaim the work of his hands. In other words, when you go somewhere that's beautiful and you look around, it's preaching to you that there is a God. And actually, you can learn that truth without any other information needed. You don't need the Bible to know that there is a creator. Creation itself testifies to that. So we can learn some things about God just by looking around us. But there's so much about God that we couldn't naturally discover on our own. And even that psalm, Psalm 19, speaks of that because not only does it say the heavens declare the glory of God, it then starts talking about the fact that God speaks through his word. And that is precisely what we need, a God who speaks to us. Because on our own, we could never, never work out what God is like. We could perhaps work out there's a creator. We could perhaps work out that he's powerful. But the rest of it would be a blur to us. And so what we need is for God to speak. And God in his word speaks and shows us things about himself. So here's a few truths that we learn about God that are really important for us as we think about the gospel. God is eternal. That is to say he's always existed. There's no beginning or end to this God. God is holy. We thought about that even in the children's talk. That is to say he's pure in every possible way. We live in a world where evil is prevalent, but we learn in the Bible that there's no trace of evil in heaven. God can't tolerate evil. He can't look upon evil. He can't allow it into his presence. In fact, he so uh, abhors it that he will punish evil. That is God's commitment to punish evil. Now, some people don't like the idea of God punishing, but it's precisely because he's good that he punishes. He won't allow evil to prevail ultimately. Uh, another one which I mentioned last time, which, which is that God is triune, God is a trinity. And actually, this is important for the gospel because God is going to send his son. Uh, and so we need to know that actually there is a triune God, Father, Son, and Spirit, who lived long before our world because he's eternal. And this trinity of persons delight in one another, which leads to the next thing. God is love. As I said last time, you can only love if there is another to love, and there has always been another to love for God because he exists as a community of persons, Father, Son, and Spirit. And so God is a God of love. And God, within that love relationship, is joy. When you love someone, you have joy in them. So whatever your picture of God, uh, allow it to be informed by the Bible, which is that God is a community of persons where there is love and joy. And God is, of course, all-powerful. We learn in the Bible that he does what he wants to. He's not bound by any man's power or strength. God achieves what he sets out to achieve. And, of course, it's out of his power that he created and said of this world, it is good, it is good, it is good, and said over people, they are very good. That's the God that we're thinking about in the gospel. People. This leads on to the second thing, people. Now, when it comes to people, there's some important things we need to know. One is that we're very precious to God. We're very precious to God. As, as I just said, we're created by God. God. The triune God said, let us make man in our image as beings that are relational with the ability to love. And God looked on them and says, they are very good. God has a, a special place in his heart for people. He loves all of his creation, but he has a special place for people. And so we read in in one of the Psalms, David says, I'm fearfully and wonderfully made. I praise you because I'm fearfully and wonderfully made. Before a word was on my tongue, you knew it, says David. Such knowledge is too wonderful for words. So we need to know that actually God has a very uh, loving heart for people. They are precious to him. But also, the flip side of that that we've seen in recent weeks is that we're sinners. We come to God, this holy God, this eternal God, this righteous God, as people who are not naturally 
pure. In fact, we are the opposite. We are sinful. We saw that that came in that initial fall through Adam. And as we thought about last time, as we saw in our doctrinal basis, that nature of Adam is in each one of us. We make selfish choices. If you know your own heart well enough, you'll know that it is self-centered. It is naturally looking for your own goods above the needs of others. That's how we all are, naturally. We care too much about ourselves. And one of the fundamental differences between Christianity and most religions is that most people, most religions present a a path of morality that they're hoping to achieve so that God might accept them. They're trying to climb that mountain to reach God. And as I said at the beginning, the thing that's distinct about the Christian faith is there's a recognition at the outset we could never do that. We could never come to God. We could never reach God. You can do all the good things in the world, but you'll still not stand right before God because God is perfect. He's perfect. The Bible says about us, all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God. As I just said, the heavens declare the glory of God. God is a glory. Heaven is full of glory, and God will not compromise that one ounce. He won't let things that aren't glorious into his heaven. And we fall short, and therefore we find ourselves lost. We find ourselves facing God's judgment, because the reality is for God to maintain his holiness, that wrongdoing needs to be dealt with. Our sinful choices, our sinful thoughts, they need to be dealt with, and what they deserve is punishment. And as we said, this God, as we thought about this God, this God is an eternal God, and therefore the punishment they deserve is eternal. This is bad news. Christianity begins with bad news. True news, but bad news. But actually, the good news is that God doesn't leave it like that. He could leave it like that. He would be totally within his rights to leave it like that. But the good thing is that God has a path of salvation. When we thought about the fact that that God is holy, we also said, though, that he is also a God of love. And God will not compromise any of his attributes. God never sets one above the other. They all intermingle. All these attributes of God, they find a oneness in him. And and as we said then, he has an affection for people. He looked at people and he loved them and he never lost that love. God never, never forsook his love for people. And so he acted. The God of love acted in the most remarkable way. Here's a verse that's familiar to most of us. It says this, For God so loved the world that he gave his one and only son so that whoever believes in him shall not perish but have eternal life. What is that saying? Well, we said that God is triune. He lives as a community of persons. That that community has the deepest affection. The The son of God and the spirit of God are so precious to the father that for him to give his son was for him to give his best. And he was willing to send his son into the world. Jesus became one of us. He took that name, Jesus. He was born in a stable. He grew up and he revealed God to us. That means if you want to know what God is like, you look at Jesus. People often say, well, we could never know what God is like. Absolutely, we can know what God is like because this God has come among us in the person of Jesus. And as you look at Jesus, you see him operating in a remarkable way, a way that really upset religious people because he spent time with tax collectors, with prostitutes, with sinners, people that the world thought were so unworthy. And Jesus said this, it is not the healthy who need a doctor, but the sick. I've come not to call the righteous, but sinners. Now, of course, there are no righteous people. It's just the recognition that some of us hopefully recognize we're not righteous. That's the point Jesus is making. Those who recognize their need are the ones that Jesus came for. So Jesus drew near to those that the world shunned. But even that wasn't enough for us to get back to God. The love that Jesus showed in drawing near wasn't enough because as we said, God is holy and our sin needs a punishment. God is a righteous judge and therefore must punish sin. And that's what's so good about the gospel. We had a verse in our reading which says this, God made him who had no sin to be sin for us so that in him we might become the righteousness of God. That him is Jesus. God made Jesus 
who knew no sin. Jesus never did anything wrong. He's the only one that's never done anything wrong. God made Jesus, who knew no sin, to be made sin for us so that we might become the righteousness of God. That is a wonderful thing. It's saying that an incredible exchange has taken place. God has given his very best in order to bring us back to him. Jesus came among us. He lived a perfect life. People tried to trap him time and time again, but he always did the right thing. Never failed. And he was perfect. And yet, despite being perfect, he was nailed to a Roman cross. And miraculously, this was part of God's sovereign plan, to allow his son to die, because Jesus went to that cross to pay a punishment, a punishment for human sin. Jesus wasn't there by mistake. It wasn't a failure. Jesus went there to pay a punishment, a punishment for sin, a punishment, though, that he did not deserve, a punishment that should have fallen on us because we are guilty, and yet he was treated as though he was guilty. He paid the price because he loves us. He gave his life as a ransom so that we can go free, so that we can be reconciled to God. Because as I said at the beginning, God is holy, God is pure. We are sinful. What we need is to be brought back to God. And Jesus took all our sin upon himself so that we can. The glorious thing about the Christian faith is not only does he take our sin, but he gives us his righteousness. So what what does all that mean? Well, it means that God looks upon the Christian not simply as forgiven. If If you're a Christian, you're forgiven, but not simply forgiven. God doesn't just look at you and think, oh yeah, I've let them off that, I've let them off that, I've let them off that. When we forgive someone, we don't we don't forget what they've done. Do we? We, you know, we? we forgive them, but actually it's still there. But actually God does more. He looks on us as though we'd lived the perfect life, as though we'd lived the life that Jesus lived. Isn't that wonderful? That God sees your failures, he knows them. It's not that he forgets them in an ultimate sense, but that's not how he looks upon you. If you're a Christian, he looks upon you as though you had lived the righteous life that Jesus lived. That is wonderfully good news. And the Bible uses different language here for for, for different aspects of this. It uses the language of justification. So it's as though we've done nothing wrong. You're free to go because you've done nothing wrong. Isn't that wonderful? That God looks on you and says you're free to go. It's just as if I'd never sinned, as we sometimes used to sing. Another word, adoption. God brings you into his family. As I said last time, I love that particular image because it's so relational. It's not simply forgiven sinner. It's come into the family. You become a brother with Jesus. You become so united with him that his father becomes our father and he delights in us. Sometimes I I think this is the most uh, under-realized truth for us as Bible-believing Christians. I think we realize I'm forgiven, but we can't quite bring ourselves to say, God absolutely smiles upon me, because we think that sounds presumptuous. It's not presumptuous, it's an affirmation of how good Jesus is. When we say God smiles upon us, we're saying saying God absolutely delights in Jesus, and we're so united with him that he delights in us. So to say anything less than God delights in the Christian is actually to undermine the goodness of Jesus. Jesus is so good and his father delights in him so much and he says when you become in him, you're so linked to him that the smile of God becomes upon you. So Charles Spurgeon says it so well, God is so boundlessly pleased with Jesus that in him he is altogether pleased with us. Good news indeed. And the promise of course is eternal life in his presence, isn't it? John 3.16 we read, whoever believes in him shall not perish but have eternal life. That is, that is a, a huge part of the gospel that actually we won't live in the state we live in forever. Life is really hard, isn't it, at times? Uh, As I've said many times, I've spent a lot of time with some of you guys, and you're going through really hard things. And life is wearisome at times. But the promise, the promise is that we get to be with our God forever in a place that doesn't resemble this one, in a body that doesn't resemble, well, it resembles it in some way, but it's perfect. All the things that are wrong with this world will be taken away. A place of perfection, a new heaven, a new earth, glory. That's what awaits us. That's salvation. And as we look again at that verse, John 3.16, the salvation that it speaks of, it does say that whoever believes in him shall not perish, doesn't it? So there is a response that's needed. There is a response that's needed. The gospel is a message of God's grace. He gives undeserved kindness to us. He deals with our sin 
by doing what we couldn't. He offers us life in his presence. It's a gift. But like all gifts, it needs to be opened. It needs to be responded to. Today is my son's 10th birthday. He, opened, he woke up and there were lots of presents. If he just left them there, they wouldn't be very meaningful, would they? But when he opens them, there's joy. <laughs> he's thrilled with what he's got. This is a gift and it needs to be opened. It needs to be opened. And we see in that verse in John 3.16 how it's opened. It's opened by faith. We see in other parts of Scripture that it's opened by repentance. So what does that mean? What does it mean for us to believe? Well, first of all, we need to, we need to realize our need of Jesus. We need to see, actually, yeah, it's true, there is a living God that is holy and pure. And as I examine my life, I realize I could never on my own scramble my way to him. We need to recognize that. We need to be sorry for that. And we need to see that God has given us a solution, which is Jesus. So that faith that, that is spoken of in that verse in John is, is exactly that. Lord, I'm a sinner. I've messed up. I need your grace. And I think there's only one place I can find it, and that is in Jesus. And God promises that when we have true faith in Jesus, that the, this gift of eternal life is given to us, that our chains can be taken away, that we can walk in freedom. And it's such good news that why would you not want it? This isn't, this isn't religion. This is the opportunity to know the living God and he's paid it all for us to do so. And when that happens, we have a whole new life. So we had in our reading this verse, if anyone is in Christ, the new creation has come. The old is gone, the new is here. Some of the other translations will say he is a new creation or they are a new creation. We, we become something new. This particular translation is drawing on the fact that God is going to make all things new and we're already part of that. He's already purchased us to be part of that. We don't feel the full benefits of it yet, of it yet but we will one day because we are part of that new creation. He stamped himself, he stamped his spirit over us and says, you, 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 you're going to be part of that new creation. You're going to enjoy all of these benefits. So friends, this is the gospel and it is really good news. In... in in the rest of the series, we're going to think about some of the implications of this because actually this is what should be central to a church. This is, should it impact our relationships. Obviously, it's what we, the message we share. But actually, we first of all need to know that we know it ourselves. Do we know this gospel? Have we trusted Jesus? Is he our only hope, our only confidence? And do we know that if we have faith in him, we don't need to walk around with guilt and shame for our past mistakes? God doesn't look on them. He looks on Jesus. God is so boundlessly pleased with Jesus that when he looks upon you, if you're in Christ, he smiles upon you. Wonderful gospel truths. These things are familiar to many of us, but may they never cease to amaze us. What a God we have. The gospel is indeed good news. If you have never made the step of following Jesus, I'd love to talk with you more about that afterwards because this grace is for you, my friends. Let's pray.